everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, let me share the presentation. All right, so today we will be talking about the, all the LLM stuff. And the question of today, if they really can reach the human precision and what are their roadblocks on that road? So let's start from the quick intro. Just who is this guy? Uh, my name is Jared Costin. I have uh, roughly 11 years of experience in data science and machine learning and analytics. Uh, my, uh, like the main area of uh, activities are natural language processing and uh, AutoML stuff. From the natural language processing part, uh, I think I built the first uh, commercial a uh, large language model in the end of 2018. It was uh, a simple use case, uh, like for the uh, customer service, uh, they will receive in a set of questions from the clients regarding orders they made. And the questions were really like uh, very uninformative, like how is my order? What's going on? Uh, can you handle this? So not much information. So what we did, we actually uh, collected all the activities from those clients on the website, uh, converted this flow into the set of events, uh, just like a tokens, and then use it was a bird. Actually, uh, we use bird to construct a more comprehensive output. So what they what they actually did on the website given the question uh, yeah that was nice and uh, now i am working at uh, data gpt where we are building the first conversation on a list tool using the large language models but not purely we're using other ml and data science techniques uh, i will talk about some of them today but yeah let's get back to the main topic of the session so what are the LLMs and can they really do a good analysis? I'm quite sure that everyone heard about the large language model, especially when OpenAI launched the GPT-4 and even GPT-3.5 and 3 was quite an impressive stuff. But uh, just to general understanding, because uh, our level of attendees uh, not require the complete understanding how the large language model may work. I will give you some brief explanation what's the, what sits under the hood, uh, but we would not go very deep into details. I will try to keep it simple and we will concentrate on those aspects that which will be required to understand uh, the main part, like if the large language model can do analysis and can do it at a very good quality. So first of all, large language models or LLMs, they, the main purpose uh, is to predict the next word in a sequence. So what the sequence is, it's basically the question or the context you're sending to the large language model as an input and the large language model is supposed to give the output, basically predicting it word by word. How did they train? Whenever the large language model is able to generate the next, the next token, it requires a vast amount of data to be trained in advance. This is quite important because we will be talking about some stuff like hallucinations, which are quite a roadblocks in order to use large language model for data analysis. And therefore the training data and the way how the model is trained is one or the source of hallucinations. So when you would like to train a large language model, you would need extremely big set of textual data. So you really need a huge corpus. I will show you a couple of examples of the text corpuses which we used for the training 
of large language models a couple of years ago. Now it's even bigger, but the amount of uh, the amount of data is measured in terabytes. So uh, how they are actually trained? The large language model, the large language model is receiving the set of our uh, tokens as an input and predicts the next word based on the given input. So uh, this is the process requires a lot of iteration and a lot of computing power. Actually quite expensive one, like very expensive GPU clusters or specific, like very specific uh, stuff that uh, specific chips that were designed for the training and it's very costly. So to train the model, like OpenAI one, that will cost dozens of millions at least or even more, like depends on the size of data you would like to use for the training. So the big, uh, the big concern here, if you would like to use the large language model, you either need to use the one which already been trained by someone, or you need a significant amount of investments to do it by yourself. Let's go a bit deeper into how large language model works. And here, uh, it will be a bit of formulas and statistics. Uh, I would tell you in advance that it's a kind of simplification that uh, we would need to understand better how large language model actually uh, works whenever they are going to predict their response on your input. We can consider a simple uh, concept of large language model as a statistical machine, which main point is to predict the next word given the input context. So here is the simple bias theorem. It's a very, very uh, big simplification, but nevertheless, uh, that's what we need to understand uh, the other part of the presentation when I will be talking about roadblocks. So considering the bias theorem, we can uh, conceptualize the LLM as the bias probability. So uh, simple representation of that is we have an input sequence, like your question, for instance, to the LLM, which is A, and uh, we expect some answer from the model, which should be generated word by word or talking by talking, which is basically B. And this is called posterior in the bias theorem. So posterior means what is the probability of the word in the answer given a certain context as an input. So we can uh, think like a simple example, a cat seed on the, and then what's the next word? So it could be sofa, or it could be chair, or it could be table, or it could be floor. So there is a certain probability of the best candidate based on other parts of the equation. First, it's prior. Prior, it's initial probability of the word SQL uh, before considering the new word. So what is the probability overall of cat is sitting on something, right? Then we have a likelihood. The likelihood part is the probability of seeing the new word given the preceding sequence. So what is the probability that we will pick the sofa or what is the probability that we will pick the chair or the table? And that's divided also by another part, which is called marginal. And the marginal is the overall probability of an current in the new world in any context. Like what is the probability of having the word so far with any other context? So whenever this statistical machine is deciding on the next word, 
it consider the frequency of the work is going to predict like what is what is the more frequent the sofa the chair or the table whenever we are talking about a cat so probably cat sitting on the table is not that appropriate one so we would not see that much frequent cases in the training data but uh the cat sitting on the sofa or sitting on the chair it's uh, quite a frequent case so then the model would pick the most frequent word based on the data it learned again it's a kind of simplification the uh, actual large language models they are a bit more complex than this uh, bias representation but uh, the bias theorem is a very uh, simple stuff to understand how the large language model decide on the next word so they are looking at the word frequency and the probability of having this word in the given context so now let's talk a bit what are the roadblocks in terms of using the LLMs for the data analysis and data processing. So we know ChatGPT is quite good in writing points and summarizations, in answering the general questions, in writing the code. That's fine. But when it comes to data analysis, what's different here? And the huge difference in data analysis that the outcome of the large language model should be accurate enough. What does it mean? Someone probably heard about the term like hallucinations. Uh, let me briefly explain what the hallucinations are. So the large language model hallucinate whenever they produce a fake response, which is not true, not trustworthiness content, or uh, irrelevant response uh, given the question you asked. So whenever the response is not true or it doesn't match your actual question or it's completely misleading. And the problem with the LLMs, there are no good way you can control it and you can teach them do not hallucinate. So whenever you will send some piece of data to the LLM, we'll ask to analyze it. It will probably do this, but it's very likely that it will come up with some conclusions that are not existing in the data. What does it mean in the real application of the LLM to data analysis? That means that you can't trust the LLM. You can't use the LLM outcomes to the decision making, so, which is quite a roadblock factor, right? So hallucinations uh, is the biggest roadblock factor of using the LLMs for data analysis. But the question is, why they are happening? Like, why the model hallucinate? And to understand this part, let's talk a bit about three main reasons why the hallucination exists. We already talked how models are usually trained, how models decide on their next word they will pick for the response. And now we can probably come up with some conclusions. By the way, those conclusions, they are based on different research at that area. Uh, and the topic is still fresh, like there are not that many papers and uh, teams who are researching their hallucination effect on them but there are some and i just summarized the three main factors that leads to the hallucinations the first factor is biased or bad training data what does it mean so let's switch to another slide and first let's look a bit closer onto the table on the left side. Here is a set of data sets. Uh, they are open data sets and majority of them being used in the model training. Uh, for instance, you can see on the top C4 and MC4, 
those two were used to train the first version of GPT model by OpenAI and many other large language models as well. They both based on the source, which is called the common crawl. Common crawl is basically a copy of the majority of websites in the internet being crawled using the automatic web scrubbers. It's clean, so they're completely irrelevant resources are filtered, but nevertheless, there are still a lot of resources which contain some misleading information. So you can imagine how many websites in the internet and how many biased information that could be. Their religion bias, their uh, conclusion bias, their language bias. So a lot of uh, information that contains in internet may be not accurate, biased, not correct. And there is no way you can really clean it. Uh, that's very hard problem to solve. So it's like the best, the first and the best reason why the model hallucinate the data they've been trained, uh, the data they've been trained on contains lots of biases. The second reason, and this is also something interesting uh, that happened only recently, uh, you know that uh, chat GPT has an API and everyone can just uh, establish a pay you go access and start using the open AI model to generate some training data. That's like an obvious stuff. If you don't have training data, you can try to generate it synthetically using chat GPT. There are lots of models being trained using synthetic data. And there is another problem with synthetic data. Whenever you have model which generates your data, then you're using that data to train your own model, you will create your own bias. Like there are events which are very likely to happen, like the words with super high probability, they will be overestimated and the rare words, infrequent words, they will be underestimated. And then if you will use lots of such an examples and you will train that model, then you will end up having model which will generate the most frequent words in a given context and will not ever pick edge cases or uh, rare cases, but very specific to your particular question. So that's kind of problem. The second problem uh, is just next word prediction bias. What does it mean? That means the following, because the model is taking your question as a context and trying to predict the next possible word whenever you have a fake information already into your, in your prompt. Like for instance, if you say, Pluto is the smallest, and then you will ask uh, the large language model to continue this sentence. There will be different options how it can answer. It can say it's the smallest dwarf planet in our solar system, or it can say it's the smallest celestial body in the solar system. So Pluto is a planet, that's right, uh, but it's not the smallest dwarf planet. So that's the fake. Because the Pluto is the planet is the more frequent case than the Pluto is celestial body, then the model will simply pick the wrong answer because it was already pushed by the prompt you gave it. So like the second reason why the model hallucinate is because all the large prompts, wrong prompts, misleading prompts, it tries to pick the next uh, most probable word looking into the prompt you gave. And whenever you embed a wrong context or the context which may be misinterpreted, then there is a chance it will generate your the fake response. Well, the obvious question, can you do anything about that? And uh, here uh, I will talk probably 
more about the main topic of our discussion, how to fight hallucinations and how did we do it in data GPT. By the way, we have zero hallucinations in our LLM. Uh, and I will try to highlight some strategies that we are using to fight it. So first of all, you can think that, all right, whenever I'm doing data analysis, what's important? The important that you are not uh, producing wrong numbers, like whenever there is a sales figures, you should not uh, miss up that figure from the data. So if you use LLM, you should produce exactly the same figure as you have in the data. Whenever there is a fact which is stored in the data, you should preserve this fact. You shouldn't miss this up. Whenever there is a name or specific entity, you should not mix this up. You should keep the original name or entity. The good thing about that, that you can actually push the model of doing exactly that. You can either do this at the training time, if you train your model, uh, but I more like the way of post-processing whenever the model is already trained. In that way, you can change the logic on the fly so you don't need to retrain the entire model. So the idea of that is whenever model is producing the probability for the next word, you can look whether the next word is important numerical information or the fact or specific name. And whenever it is, you can assign a higher weights to numerical facts which were in the data, uh, names, and uh, exact numbers. So you can do this by re-weighting the log login predictions and the inference time. That's quite fast. You will do it anyway if you're using any type of beam search or top K or at least the temperature. So what you just need to do is to increase, to assign a higher weight to the important token, like you will skew your model probability to generate your, uh, to generate you uh, important information with the higher probability. Like you would not lose the important number, you would not lose the important fact, you would not lose the important name, you will just increase artificially, increase the probability for those entities. And that can be done at the inference time. The second point you can do is structured. There is a common uh, word in the data science world whenever we're talking about a training and fitting model, garbage in, garbage out. So that's completely relevant for the prompting in large language models. If you will fit too much irrelevant data in the prompt or in your question or in your data analysis, then the model will start to prioritize in important data versus the really important one. What, what you can do about that? Well, you can choose any structured format like YAML, for instance, there is an example of simple YAML file. Whenever you extract from the database the information, you can put it into structured format. You can just filter out all irrelevant information and you can keep it concise and understandable. The only problem with that, that you need a fast enough processing engine that can process data on the fly and produce you that type of format. Uh, we're using our appropriate uh, database, which is called Lighting Cache. It's a super fast database, uh, which is way faster than any other in-memory uh, stuff and also quite cheap. And uh, it allows also to produce a structured formats like JSON or YAML. So this is like your next step you can do in order to reduce or completely eliminate hallucination. But the cherry piece of the pie is actually the right tool for the right job. What does it mean? 
So there is a lot of discussions, how we should use large language model for data analysis, how large language models can analyze my data, how to prevent hallucinations. And the answer is uh, quite simple. Even when the large language model is really powerful, like uh, sort of models like GPT-4, for instance, it's still not really capable of producing exact responses on the task which requires a standard mass error, standard analysis. So that means that whenever we apply a model for the analysis, we are not doing analysis directly. Instead, in data GPT, we have core analytical engine, which does a bunch of analysis, quite a lot of different stuff like statistical significance, bootstrapping. Uh, we are building, uh, we are building different types of time series model, confidence intervals, other types of predictions, and uh, regular analysis like uh, distribution analysis, average calculation, standard deviation, and other stuff. But we are not using LLM for such analysis. The LLM only tells what analysis should be done, and the entire analysis is happening on their, our core analytical engine. So that means even if you have a very experienced person, like very smart engineer, which can read code in the paper, still he would not sit and write all the code on the paper. He will use lots of tools to write a good code. And the same with the LLM. So the good LLM can give you really excellent results, but never been equipped with the right tool. So what we are doing, we're just equipping our LLM with the set of right tools, which can do data analysis, which can uh, process results and convert it in a very concise and structured way. We can also do, and we are doing the uh, log its revaluation whenever we are deriving the final prediction in order to sort out, hey, this is important fact, you should assign a higher weight to it, or this is completely non-important stuff, you can assign a zero weight, so we don't care about that. So, Having all those three pillars allows us to make LLM very precise. As I said, we have zero hallucinations and we are using LLM for data analysis, also the high speed, because we are not actually doing analysis at the LLM level. We are doing the entire analysis on the core analytics and a lighting cache, which is very fast. And the LLM is just deciding what to do and then provides you feedback in the form of summarization. Uh, I think we are close to our timeline, so I will leave a floor for questions. Uh, thank you. All right, looks like we have a question here in the GoToWebinar platform. Um, so are you saying few shot prompting is the way to eliminate hallucination? Well, the prompting in itself is the source of hallucination as well. So the shorter prompt you have, the more concise, the better. And uh, we ended up having a very structured prompt in a format, like as I said, YAML or JSON. So we are using both. So having a prompt in that format would allow us to control it a lot. So if you just have a few short stuff, and they are still written in a plain text form, you still have a room for model to hallucinate because there are other tokens which are a bit irrelevant to the context. All right, we're just gonna wait a minute or two. Sometimes it takes a little while for people to type out their questions. Can you say more about the, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna mispronounce this, but YAML use? Y-M-A-L. 
Well, it's not necessary. It's just one of the structured format we're using. It's not the only format we're using. The purpose is the structured format uh, allows you to minimize any irrelevant information in the model prompt. So like the main purpose of YAML, because it's easy to read as well as easy to process and it's a text, but you can use JSON or any other structured format like list, for instance, list also a kind of way you can provide a logic to your model in the form of the code. Our next question is, is the LL M wrapped around an agent provided with math and stats tooling? Yeah, that's a kind of right uh, question. And the answer is uh, yes. So the core analytical engine uh, provides a set of a huge tooling to the LLM and the LLM decides what to use. Uh, but uh, we are doing it in a single shot. We are not like doing a chain of thoughts and not, not know any stuff like that because it's uh, uh, it's wasting the execution time and we want response to be as fast as possible. So basically, if you have the analytical engine written on whatever, like Python or uh, Java or whatever, then you can just teach LLM how to use it and the LLM will use appropriate tooling to solve the equation. And then the response is deterministic because it's done by a tooling rather than a LAM. Um, the next question is, can you explain more about strategy one briefly? Uh, dot, 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 probability reevaluation. Yeah, sure. Uh, very good question. Uh, so the probability reevaluation technique assumes that you have a certain words or certain tokens which are way more important in the response than any other like imagine you ask your like a data analysis tool how was my sales revenue last week then uh, it generates so the uh, query to database database retrieve your data back so you have a sales figures for the last in itself is very important. So if your sales was like uh, $224, you can generate any other values. So you prioritize the weight for that specific token, which correspond uh, the token into the in the prompt. And then whenever the model generate you the summarization response, it will keep the priority for the important information on top. So you will be less likely to have relevant data with that approach. All right, our next question is, who are the current customers of DataGBT? What use cases are they using it for? Uh, well, we have a media, com uh, we have the media provider, uh, we have gaming company, we have transactional company, which are like a payment processor. Uh, we have e-com as a customers, uh, like they are e-shops, they have visitors. And the main use case, like you have some events on your database and you want to track uh, how those events affects your key metric changes, like revenue or number of orders, or on time delays, if it's uh, shipping, for instance. And uh, Data GPT allows you to create, uh, basically, to put your data into a very fast data warehouse. Uh, and then uh, the uh, analytical engine will allow you to ask any data related question, which will be translated into a set of queries and an analytical tool usage and the response will be accurate and sent you back like it could be for any key metric you would like to analyze any data you can ask time series question you can ask a question regarding statistical analysis like i made a campaign how efficient was campaign and it may give you the 
complete statistical analysis based on that. So it's quite flexible. Our next question is, how does data GPT handle compliance for HIPAA, enterprise data, GDPR, and takes care of uh, P2, I think it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's uh, quite understandable. Uh, very good question. Uh, thank you. So for the uh, data privacy and data security, first, we have our own self-hosted LLM. So we are not sending data to OpenAI, like if you may think that we are doing so. We trained our own LM on our own data. We don't use your data for any training unless you really want this and ask us to do this. So we would not use it. Uh, so what we do, we have our resources hosted in their cloud providers. Our standard plans allows you to just uh, use those cloud resources we have but we also can consider option to launch on premise like if it's gdpr we can launch on the eu uh like uh cloud provider or we can even launch on your uh, hardware if there is a requirement so we are quite flexible we don't need any uh, outbound connection for our step to work. It can sit inside the firewall and it can work. I think we only have time for one more question, um, but here we go. Uh, you might have explained this in the presentation, but is data, data GVT powered by the cloud? Any future integrations with existing cloud providers? Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I was just talking about that. So we're using currently AWS and uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, to host our analytical engines. But in fact, like our solution allows us to containerize all the stuff and we can run containers on basically any hardware or any cloud providers which may be required. And we can also run it on premise like uh, on your own servers. I think we can squeeze in one more question here. Uh, how is data GBT different than OpenAI's code interpreter? Are there any data processing limits, especially for large companies? Uh, no limits, uh, but it's quite different. Uh, by first, we have no limits. So you can upload as much data as you want, like, and you can analyze as many data as you want no limits at all a uh, second quant interpreter is trying to generate the code on the fly which leads to a wrong code uh misleaded code uh i use data in, uh, code interpreter and it generates a code on the level of like a junior data scientist or junior developer very basic one and uh, a lot of very important stuff are missed so what we did instead we created all analytical parts already in advance. So we have dozens of analytical functions which built by us, tested, validated, they are precise, uh, they are correct, uh, they are fast also. And whenever we are processing your question and retrieving data, we're just uh, using those functions as building blocks to create the best analysis we can do for your use case. And we can add more functions. Like if you need a specific type of analysis, we can just add this function into our functional repository and just do this. So we are precise, we're fast, because we're using the predefined code. And uh, as I said, like whenever you ask a lamp to generate everything, uh, then you will face lots of hallucinations, mismatches and failings because uh, it still can't be that precise as their standard tooling. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.